exhausted, tired, feeling good? Awesome. <laughs> anyway, so yes, I, as I said, basically I was a student at Valpo, but not only that, my parents were students at Valpo, aunts and uncles were students at Valpo, so a true legacy. So that was in my blood for sure, and it's definitely a real honor to be with here today with you guys. So talking about my mom, she came to Valparaiso University with wide eyes with this idea to have uh, a degree in history. All she wanted to do was study abroad in the UK. And her mother at that time said, can't do that, won't do that, stay in this country. So as a result of that, she met my father, or my, her husband in this environment, and they went and spent most of their career in the UK. So I was born in England as a result of that rebellious you know, <laughs> nature against parents, maybe opportunity as well. Um, but essentially, this opportunity of living in the UK gave me uh, perspective. It's a little bit different than I think the standard American student in that being in the UK, you have access to all of Europe, travel is a pretty normal thing, exposure to lots of different cultures and different languages was kind of normalized in my upbringing. So when I was nine years old and moved to the States, I kind of felt like I had done it all, I wanted more, I had that wanderlust, and I had the whole world figured out, of course, at nine years old. Perfect. Yeah. Um, not so much the case, let's be honest. Um, so essentially, in the same way that my mother was sort of inspired by that study abroad experience that informed her career trajectory, I too had this, admittedly, probably exposure to the National Geographic or Nature Program's vision of what is the continent of Africa. And this idea that I wanted to be there and through that guise of that very limited picture of what that opportunity might look like, I thought, for sure I'm going. What did my parents say? Sorry, it's not very safe. Sorry, it's very expensive to get there. Sorry, we can't afford a safari. So I came to Valpo, convicted that I was going to follow in her footsteps, be a rebel in my own regard, and kind of push that process forward. So I came to Valpo as a vocal performance student, right? So kind of something a little di divergent from what I'm doing now and for that vision of, uh, of Africa initially. And it was my sophomore year that uh, I took an uh, entry-level course as part of the, the general core curriculum uh, with Professor Charles Schaefer here um, on African history. And in that context, I sort of had a rebirth, I would say, of that inspiration to sort of be in Africa and go along with that process. And what I particularly appreciated from that experience was essentially, yes, of course, like any class you take in this context, there's textbooks, there's the analysis, the historical analysis of that process. But he interwove these narratives of his own personal experience growing up in Ethiopia, uh, mistakes that were taken on uh, motorcycle trips throughout the, the continent, which I was just so excited by, and it kind of spoke to that earlier childhood experience of this mystical fantasy land that is the continent of Africa at that time. Yeah, so as a result of that, I, junior year, forged a relationship with this awesome couple, who if you haven't <laughs> met, please come up afterwards, the, the Politos, um, who, and Carmine at that time was running Engineers Without Borders, so a program that's still, I think, in existence under a different name. Waves. Uh, Waves. Thank you. So that was sort of the impetus. Finally, the summer between my junior and senior year, it was happening. And actually, Professor Schaefer and the Politos all kind of came with about 30 engineering students, myself, and I think two so uh, sociology degree students went along to a program in northern Kenya and Japan. And I must say, it busted this preconceived notion <laughs> of me Figuring the whole world out. So it was challenging, it was powerful, it was transformative, it was amazing. So as a result, I sort of decided, you know what? This two-week tri trip wasn't enough. I want to spend my entire senior year in the continent of Africa doing various study abroad experiences. So I initially said, you know what? But I'm also, because of this experience, being third culture, kind of getting it, been pretty, pretty okay in, this, uh, in Turkana, decided that I wanted to enroll directly into an African university and not do the safe study abroad experience you know, with a bunch of other American students, heaven forbid. So I went to the University of Dar es Salaam, which is one of the two capitals of uh, Tanzania, enrolled in the university, and from that point it became, what's a nice way to say it, a Murphy's Law experiment in <laughs> what can go wrong in a study abroad experience. Uh, so there are lots of shock value stories, but I'll kind of limit it to, to two. So first, I came back from a trip, I had a roommate in the dormitories who was Ugandan. 
Um, I came back after this trip and basically our room had been broken into, all of my stuff had been stolen, another international student was staying there while I was away, all of his stuff was stolen, and a few items from my Ugandan roommate were taken. As a result, the campus police arrested my Ugandan roommate under the very superficial analysis saying, there's two Americans living in the room and there's one Ugandan. He did it. So for the first time, and probably frankly, lucky for me, the only time I saw red. Right? So I couldn't see past the injustice that I was seeing. Right? So I went down to the campus a police station, um, went there with my very limited Swahili, and threw a fit. I don't even remember exactly what was said in that environment, but basically it was, if your legal proceedings or your investigation of this instance was black student, poor, stole stuff in the same room, then I also lived there, and someone else's stuff was taken, so I'm as guilty as he was. So why not, if you're going to arrest him, then arrest me. Or actually do police work. You know, try one of the two. So under the novelty of this moment of hyper-adrenaline, seeing red, being in hindsight very privileged and full entitled. But anyway, I went into the prison area with him. And thank God I did. So I sat with him for a while. The police officers thought it was very novel that I was in the room. They offered me water. They offered me food. They laughed and joked with me. If I tried to offer it to my roommate, they hit, him out, they hit it out of my hand and they threatened to punch him. While I was there, another person who wasn't affiliated with the university was dragged into the same prison facility on the campus. Very dark skin, but you couldn't even tell what his racial background was. He was beaten so badly that you saw purple, you saw red, you saw blood, that was it. And to make issues worse, there was a cot that was fastened to the wall and a chair fastened to the grounds. They chained his hands to the chair, they chained his legs to the bed, and they proceeded to kick him in front of us. And they said, this is what we mean to do to you. If it weren't for this white guy here, this is what we'd be doing to you. Right? So it's, I mean, for me, this is still a really hard story to tell, to be honest. To be honest. And the point is not, oh, Daniel White Saber Complex went in there and saved the day, and what? Well, absolutely not. The reality is when you see something, you can't unsee it, right? Not only can you not unsee it, but you have a responsibility to do something. That's kind of how I feel at the end of the day. So as a result of that trauma, I mean, listen, I tell the story really quickly now, but at the time, I mean, I was a wreck, right? I came from Valpo, I was sitting in the seat that you are now, and imagine you're thrown into an African context, and now you find yourself in a jail cell with a dude who's been beaten so badly you can't even describe who he is. I mean, really, really tough stuff. So I got sick, I mean, Malaria, which is probably not a, totally attributed to my, to my sort of <laughs> mental state, there's also a mosquito involved, but went to hospital and at that point thought, you know what, I'm two months into the study abroad experience, let me wave the white flag. All my parents who were living back in the UK at that time basically said, send me home, right? So I came back to Valpo, changing my entire senior year trajectory, uh, and honestly, thank God I did. Because what it actually looked like was me with the privilege that I had in the bubble that I grew up in, in this very sort of white Lutheran American, a little bit of British experience, all of a sudden was completely burst into a million pieces. I saw the world for the first time, my senior year of college. How sad is that, that? Right? So essentially that experience allowed me to forge deeper and more meaningful relationships with the community that I hope that each and every one of you have here on campus. The reality is I had friends who rallied around me. It was the first time in my life I can describe myself as being depressed. You know, things that people really struggle with. Circumstantially, I was kind of thrown into this environment where that was my truth. And I had friends at Valpo who came to my house uh, every morning at 6.30 in the morning, knowing that I probably wasn't going to wake up for my 8 o'clock class, dragged me out of bed for weeks, took me to a coffee shop, and were like, I want to hear your story. You know? How cool is that? That someone would, would see something in you and kind of accompany you on your processing. And the reality is that was a very short-lived sort of necessary phenomenon, but we kept those 6.30 appointments throughout the rest of that senior year. Because the reality is your second year of your senior year, for every single human, is existential crisis inducing, right? <laughs> what are you going to do with your life? So at first, what was something that was so selfless with few individuals to say, we're going to help you out in a difficult spot, became an opportunity for us to sort of be pulled out of our, cult, our comfort zones and processed together. At the same time, you know, Professor Schaefer heard some of these stories, and I think we agreed together that probably 
using some level of academic pursuit would be one way of processing this opportunity. So we did a, a, a he advised me on an undergraduate thesis on restorative justice focused on Rwanda and the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission following the genocide in that context. And somehow between this support network and this intellectual exercise and the relationships I had with the Politos and, and, and Professor Schaefer, I went back to Indigenous Without Borders the following summer, went back to this place that had been so challenging for me, so something I wanted so badly but went so wrong, um, and was able to sort of have that experience. So the joke, and this was planned ahead of time, but the joke essentially is they came with another group of 30 students and came back with 29. I stayed. Um, which is hard to report, right? <laughs> so parents. Um, but essentially, that the cliches were all there, right? So the day that I arrived was awesome. Every single day got better and better and better. What was the difference? Turns out Africa didn't change as a continent, as a physical place. I had. My attitude was completely different. I had woken up, I saw things as they were, and I was open to the experience in a way that that same bubble that was so warm and comforting and protecting throughout my entire childhood was a detriment to who I would become and how I would still live in this world. So after those experiences, I can't do anything other than to engage in a social justice career, I think. Um, so, I return after this experience to the, to back to the US, right? Uh, I've actually come back to the Valpo campus. It's about a year plus after I had gone back after my senior year after graduation. And I crashed on the Polito's couch, kind of retaining that experience, sort of became, it became surrogate parents to me for sure. Um, took a couple jobs like most graduates, right? Going to the coffee shop, doing whatever you need to, to get by. And Professor Schaefer and I got into a conversation. He sort of said, you know what? It's a long shot, but I have this friend of a friend who works for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and the Lutheran World Federation. They have an office in New York that's advocacy towards the UN. Let's just send them an email and see whether or not they'd be interested in having a conversation with you about your experiences and, and what they do. And that ultimately became an opportunity for an unpaid internship in Manhattan, New York, right? So things that are tough, but transformative and really, really important in my life trajectory. And as a result of that experience, I was able to network like crazy. I was able to sort of work harder than I ever worked before. I was able to sort of identify some of my truth, this experience I had had, into a political space where we, through the faith networks, we will identify sort of a narrative, evidence from programs for faith-based organizations to impact policy at the multilateral level. I was like a kid in a candy shop. Imagine at 22 years old walking through the halls of the UN and being taken seriously. I mean, it was bananas. It really was absolutely fantastic. But that led to sort of a love for the work, a love for creating spaces for people to come and speak their truth and their experience to power. Now, what I didn't say was speak for them towards spaces of power, but really to, to my job, the privilege that I carry, the heritage that I happen to be born into gives me a responsibility to create spaces for others to harness their, their agency and uh, really make a huge impact, I think, on this world. That experience, like so many of you, I think, will experience now as you enter your careers. The truth of jobs these days is sort of internships, consultancies, short-term project-based work. I mean, lots of sectors are kind of taking that approach as opposed to long-term career trajectory, which I think our, our parents' generations really benefited from. So there are challenges and opportunities that exist with that. For me, it was an opportunity in the sense that I could ping pong between several themes of work. So I went to Washington, D.C. and ran a Get Out the Vote campaign in 2007 for the 2008 election. Uh, it was again with an ecumenical network of faith organizations. So I had then an opportunity of this awakening of sort of universal human rights and this justice that I had to see in this world. And I was going, my job was to go to congregations all over the country, focusing on swing states and talking to people of faith about why they should engage in elections. Weird, weird stuff. <laughs> but super, they're super interesting and a lot to learn. But you think, you think things are polarized now, my goodness, it was, it, was a, it was a crazy time. That opportunity kind of translated itself really quite well into pursuing higher education. So at that point, I went off to grad school, uh, had the benefit of going back to England, kind of to identify a little bit of that, that cultural identity that I kind of had deep down somewhere. 
uh, went to SOAS, which is the part of the University of London, and they got a degree in political economy of violence, conflict, and development. So some might argue a degree in a nice bar chat, right? Really philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> there were some applications in practical terms, but um, that experience sort of lended itself to building a bit of a credential, right? The reality is, again, this is where the ego and entitlement kind of comes back in to a certain extent. You get these credentials and you think, it's time for me to take a next step. Although when you go to grad school, you've stepped away from the job market for a year, and you come back and it's almost like you're starting from square one again. So I ran around quite a lot trying to find myself. I uh, worked for a summer camp, which did reconciliation work between uh, different religious groups. So there was kids from America, from the US, uh, from inner city, from urban settings, Muslim students, Christian students, from South Africa, from Israel, Palestine, from Sudan, South Sudan, from all over the country. And that was a really fascinating uh, learning opportunity as well to sort of hear from young people in the context who aren't yet indoctrinated into sort of the national narrative that happens in their country context. And they were able to sort of find common ground in this idyllic setting in upstate New York. A really cool experience. Quickly went off to work for larger global ecumenical entities, uh, the World Council of Churches, Act Alliance, all that's in the bio. But now I'm working for a startup uh, called Inspiraction. I have to some camera and tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now. But that's sort of what brought me here. So the pan point of purpose uh, definitely brought me here. The point being, life is an absolute strange journey, right? So I could not have mapped out any of these elements nor experiences in general. So I feel like the common denominator here really is an openness to whatever happens, right? As long as you're open to it, I feel like my faith tradition tells me that it's not in my hands anyway. <laughs> there is clearly a plan for me. At the same time, who knows what that's gonna be in each step you kind of learn along the way. The second piece is really community, right? It's sort of like, if you don't have that social safety net, when things get tough, and they will, right, where do you fall back on, right? Is it family, is it friends, et cetera? Like, it's an essential piece. So Inspiraction USA is a brand new organization. It's been in existence for four years. I've been the executive director for the last two. Uh, we are connected to Christian Aid, which is a large organization in, in England. Has anyone heard of Christian Aid? Yeah, no, no, I didn't either. <laughs> no, I had, but um, essentially they're very similar church world service. Is that an organization you guys are familiar with? So it's the same idea. So essentially it's all the Protestant, Orthodox, and Anglican traditions in the UK came together to build a process right after World War II, or an organization after World War II. And their immediate mission was to respond to immigration crises that was happening in that context. They've since grown into one of the most reputable humanitarian and long-term development organizations in the world. And uh, I was thrilled to sort of be part of their growing global family, essentially. Um, what do we focus on? So we can't do the totality of work with such a large organization, uh, like Christian Aid, with 100 million pound annually budgets, 1,000 people working in 40 countries in the world. Uh, at this time, it was me and a board of directors. So we wanted to limit the scope of work that we're engaging with in order to sort of uh, build uh, ourselves, build our brand, build our identity. So first and foremost, we respond to sort of emergencies, right? So you've probably seen the news, what's happening in Indonesia. Right now we have a proliferation of emergencies. There's flooding in southern India. There's been another super typhoon going through the Philippines. So humanitarian response basically means life-saving aid, right? Anything else I would put in the category of long-term development. And usually that's a fund you put together that offers life-saving aid in the immediate reality after the emergency actually takes place, right? So we engage in that work. This is deeply in partnership with Christian Aid. The humanitarian framework is, is, uh, is built upon global norms and standards, which I think for accountability purposes, to make sure that the services are given to all people, regardless of their background, their faith, their gender, their orientation, et cetera, receive the same goods because it's the flight ticket. Um, secondly, we're looking at addressing inequalities. So addressing inequalities is kind of a new way of talking about poverty, right? For a long time, you probably were familiar with the language of we eradicate poverty, right? The challenge we've had with that construct is essentially that it drives nonprofits to build solutions to symptoms of poverty not the root causes. So by looking at 
inequalities, A, you're basically saying, yes, there's a phenomenon called absolute poverty. There's a need uh, in some parts of the world which is more extreme than other places. But it doesn't mean you're ignoring where a middle-income country, like a country in Latin America, for instance, which is dealing with horrific political realities, still has people who are marginalized by society who need support. And traditionally, when you look at a, a poverty eradication model, it's really difficult to channel or justify work in those spaces. However, addressing inequalities obviously allows you to sort of find those spaces and to find room in this country, as it turns out, we're quite unequal ourselves, aren't we? So under the inequalities, again, the focusing is sort of programs that specifically impact and benefit the lives of women and girls. Um, indigenous populations. I also say forest dwelling, which is a term I don't think many people are familiar with. Essentially, it's the idea like the quilombola in Brazil. Has anyone heard of the quilombola? So during, when Brazil was under occupation by the Portuguese, there were African slaves brought to Brazil, some of whom escaped sugar plantations went into the Amazon rainforest and basically started living in like very sort of in tune with what indigenous peoples had done for a long time. So forest dwelling means they might not have that indigenous heritage, but the needs, the concerns, uh, the realities that are experienced by these populations is, is quite in tune. So we want to make sure that we're identifying those opportunities. And for us, so we consider ourselves faith inspired. What does that mean? Why is it different from faith based? So a faith-based organization essentially would be institutionally affiliated to a denominational structure, a faith tradition, whereas we're not. We're connected to a Christian organization in the UK. Uh, we're not directly affiliated to any US church, but we're inspired by the same morals and values that sort of drive that work in general. I think it's quite cool that while there's this, I think, relevant, probably very important discourse on issues of human sexuality that's happening across churches globally, the benefit we will have is essentially because we're doing poverty eradication, inequalities of uh, programming, and humanitarian responses, we're not really worried about the moral discourse. We're identifying the needs of particular communities around the world and the distinction of those needs from other demographics. So this is why we can do a lot of work on LGBTI where other faith traditions sometimes stumble um, based on a theological discernment process. And then lastly, I mentioned the Kilimbola, which I just learned about it. I feel like everyone should know about the Kilimbola. I think it's just absolutely cool. That story, why do we not know about the Kilimbola? But in the Amazon rainforest, essentially, this is, this is work where, because of this affiliation to Christian aid, we have now 70 years of experience with local community-based partners throughout Bolivia, Peru, uh, Brazil, where there's trusting relationships to those communities. A startup would never be able to go to Amazon and be like, hey guys, we're here to help. I mean, this is just not the way these things work. So by working directly through community-based organizations who already have pre-existing relationships with indigenous populations, we'll do quite a lot here in the US with those trusting relationships that our actual work is happening, which is pretty cool, I think. How do we engage in this work? So again, we are faith-inspired, but we work with all people uh, across this country. A lot of our supporters may or may not be faith-based themselves, and we think that's absolutely fine but we still carry that sort of ethos forward. Um, again, I mentioned our affiliation to Christian Aid. All of our programs will never be uh, sends Americans somewhere to deliver a service to a population. There are some situations where interventions like that can be justified and absolutely are needed. At the same time, what I think is really quite cool is that we can walk in solidarity and accompaniment with local organizations that literally know the work already are doing it really, really brilliantly, what they need are resources. Sometimes some capacity, sometimes some expertise or some technical advice, but for the most part, give resources, build an accountability model, and it actually works well. We're based in Manhattan, so we have pretty regular access to, to the UN. So again, it's sort of about how do we extrapolate experiences from our country programs around the world, adapt that in a conversation with diplomats to inform policies that then hopefully make a positive impact on people's lives, right? Also in Washington, D.C., we work in partnership with other ecumenical networks, again, bringing the experience of our programs to those conversations, where they can go and speak to Capitol Hill and kind of talk about the realities that's experiencing, and hopefully beyond the statistical analysis which most policymakers kind of use to drive what's made into policy, we can provide that human face, that narrative, you know, of, of why it makes a difference, essentially, which 
maybe it'll surprise you, but sometimes politicians forget out people and think a little bit about themselves. Um, so maybe you need it. Yeah? We also do events at Issue Education in the City, lots of happy hour events, um, lots of concerts. We have this really quite cool support from the Broadway community in New York, um, and a couple other things. So we can kind of animate the celebratory aspect of our work in a way that I think is quite transformative. And then social media is a growing portfolio, which you guys get probably instinctively, and I'm struggling. Um, <laughs> we work in, like I said, with Christian Aid Networks, we work in 40 countries around the world. Gives you a bit of an indication. I should also mention that Professor Schaefer, his first day of that entry level class, has anyone taken the African History 101 entry level course? Yeah? The first day he gives a blank map of Africa. Yeah? And says, just write all the country names. Yeah. So it turns out that Africa's capital is not Kenya. Yeah? <laughs> nice. 50, 54 countries going on. So I mean, so I leave a, a blank map saying, you know what this means, right? Yeah? Perfect. <laughs> Me either. We'll talk about it afterwards. But I, in 40 countries of the world, but mostly just in South America, obviously, Africa and Asia. So board, um, some of Christian age, some religious leaders, CEOs of other corporations, uh, quite a cool group. Um, do you guys, anyone watch um, Spike Lee's She's Gotta Have It? Netflix? She's gotta have it, Spike Lee. Cool. Um, <laughs> we're growing a team um, in New York. So we have uh, a staff base in London who works 50%, two other staff, one communicator, one sort of outreach officer. So we're kind of growing a team. After two years, we got to sort of cultivate a bit of a, a staff presence. Is something that was massively needed, but it's, it's taken some time. And just to give you a, kind of a sense of who we are, I wanted to share that. So events, Brooklyn Nine-Nine fans, American Idol. Some cool folks have kind of come out of the woodwork to support our work in an interesting way. And I really attribute this not to sort of say, all right, there is a celebritization of the aid industry, which is disgusting, and I, I, I actually have an issue with it. However, in this particular political moment, I think lots and lots of folks are trying to find issues of social justice that don't put them necessarily into a political silo, where they can sort of speak to the values they, they, they carry in a way that's not pointing fingers. Right? I think there's a plenty of that going on in this country. So the idea of sort of celebrating the work in sustainable development of humanitarian response is sort of the idea behind a lot of these events. To kind of raise some awareness and get that, that kind of hook. So just to give you an idea of what our marketing kind of thing is and get a sense of one of our country programs in Bolivia. I want to share this and hopefully it works. And uh, do we have the speaker? We do! And if not, no big deal. Just so you can hear someone else for a little while, you know. <laughs> a lot for me. Did you know Bolivia has the highest rate of domestic and intimate partner violence in South America? Experts have estimated that this issue affects more than 70% of Bolivian women and girls. In response to these staggering statistics, Inspiration and its partners are creating safe spaces for people to speak their truth. These stories represent calls to action for community leaders, government officials who can build policies that will end impunity and bring these perpetrators to justice. Additionally, according to Bolivia Statistical Institute, only 57% of royal Bolivians have access to energy. In some of the most remote areas of the Amazon, Inspiraction and partners are actively working to close the energy gap. Projects are being implemented to harness the energy of the sun to generate lighting, power mechanical water pumps, and even cook meals with solar ovens. With your help, Inspiraction can continue this work with vulnerable populations who are owning their agency and harnessing renewable resources to benefit themselves, their communities, 
and future generations. My name is DeWanda Wise, and I'm inspired for action, and I hope you are too. So the point of this is that we're trying to tell stories, right? That's what our responsibility is. It's kind of bring some issue education, and I hope you agree that kind of keeping to a minute and a half is about as much as attention span that I have, right? So maybe in the same, same boat, right? So the idea is essentially how do we talk about really difficult issues, knowing that our news media will focus exclusively on the Kavanaugh uh, situation at the Supreme Court, and you're not going to hear about anything else, right? So how do we engage with people such as yourself, right? Does this help? <laughs> Would be a question. So things like that. Did you know that Bolivia has the highest rate of gender-based violence of any country in the world? Right? I mean, I just feel like these are really important factoids that you just don't have access to unless you go looking for the information. Uh, and I think it's really quite an interesting role that we can play to kind of start to animate a story and hopefully make you ask more questions, right? Engage with us, engage with someone else, say, I, I saw this online, etc. So that's sort of the idea behind these videos. So wrapping up really quickly, essentially, you know, we work with a lot of folks. There's UN presentations, there's Working with the ELCA has a, a huge program on outreach to in, uh, Native communities in the U.S. So we've been kind of working on where our indigenous work looks around the world with existing U.S. relationships uh, and tons of folks. Again, I talked a little bit about our advocacy work. So to be honest with you, I'm probably much more of an advocate than an ad activist, which is almost blasphemous to say these days. But as a result of the fact that there's not much space for advocacy to happen, uh, the U.S. mission at the U.N., for example, will not take a meeting with civil society. So no NGO, no ordinary American can walk in and have a conversation about what they're presenting towards the U.N. This has never happened before. So, I mean, there's, in terms of the shrinking space for us to share our voice, uh, it's very, very limited. Um, so, what do we do? We take to the streets. Yeah? So we've been joining a lot of social movements. So while we are an international organization that primarily provides funding, resources, capacity for organizations, we also are engaging ourselves in the climate march and the women's march and other sort of social movements that demonstrate our solidarity uh, in general. That's it. You made it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, if you have any questions, I'm really, really happy to answer. And we can talk much more about the actual programmatic work in each country. I'm really happy to go in that direction. But in all honesty, as a startup, most of my job is consultations. So it would be really helpful to hear from you if you don't have a question. What kinds of organizations do you support? Do you support organizations? What do you think about that pie chart of where your money goes? Yeah? Things like that. What advice would you say? Was that video rubbish? Throw it out? Let's try again? <laughs> All that's helpful. Genuinely. Come on, who doesn't like to complain a little bit? No, but if you have any questions, I'm really happy to answer. Um, you said earlier that you have a problem with, like, the celebritization of Medicaid. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes, I would love to. So essentially, it kind of started in the early days, right? So in the 1980s, there was an emergency in Nigeria in a region called Biafra, right? It's the first time that the news media came into a humanitarian disaster and started taking pictures of emaciated, starving African children which was massively effective in Europe and the US in terms of generating funds because we felt so bad for that other person somewhere else. But the reality is you're painting this completely inappropriate picture of people who have innate resilience and dignity and agency and kind of how dare you paint a picture of this emaciated Afri you know, African baby to sort of paint a picture of the continent. In the same way that sort of went along with uh, ambassadors, so a celebrity, the idea was essentially, again, for fundraising purposes, that you send someone who's charismatic, that's you know, a face, a celebrity that we're familiar with, you go send them on a trip, one time, one week, they take lots of pictures with uh, children in the communities, and that's kind of it. 
the, the negative impact essentially is the superficiality of that relationship. Now, there, there are some celebrities that do remarkable philanthropic work, have spent a lot of time cultivating relationships in the communities, and that's not what I'm talking about. It's more the sort of like the optics of the growth of Hollywood having these offices and these teams that literally just pair celebrities with organizations for that really kind of narrow conversation on what is, what is poverty. So that's really the issue. Have you guys seen stuff like that? Does that kind of give you a reaction? Sarah McLaughlin loves to sing songs of the, you know, our commercials about the arms of the angels and how Those are about puppies. Those ones are, you're right, that's about puppies, but you see my point. Any other questions? Yeah? Can you mention like accountability or policy? Like how do you like Fascinating question. Thank you very much. So essentially, we have a matrix through which we identify our, what I call our trusted partners. So it's not that we say, this is the work we want to do in this context, and you're probably an organization that does that, and then you channel money to them and say, good luck. There's a vetting process to identify what their values are, what their ways of working are, what are the community access points are, you know, when we give you money, how will it work, and we can accompany that journey, right? And so it depends on where that money comes from, really. At the end of the day, there are grants that come from USAID, from large foundations, where they'll, the donor will have massive expectations in terms of the report back from the implementation of that program. Now, here's the challenge with that, right? So one of the things we're trying to do is agitate a conversation around accountability in the sense where circumstances change and donor priorities are quite limited, right? So what we're trying to do as a small startup is to say, Listen, we need to have accountable, transformative relationships with the partners that are implementing services. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to come to you with maybe four or five projects from the country you've expressed some interest in, but it's going to come from the community identifying their needs and concerns first. They'll communicate it with that partner, and the partner will share those notes with us. So we go to the donor and sort of say, here's your menu, right? Don't tell us what you're willing to fund. We're going to tell you what the community is asking for. So again, it's that back both direction. Uh, conversation that I think is a new way of working that is still quite accountable. Yeah. Any yeah. So you spoke about a little bit about how today in US media it's all cabin a cabin, blah blah blah. Right. Um, what's the best way for young people to like to stay up to date on important global issues that are important to the world and not just negative? Totally. This is where I think social media can be both problematic and massively transformative, to be honest. But I think that there is, as your network expands, I think there are opportunities to hear direct primary source information from individuals experiencing it. Granted, it comes with their bias, right? But I think that's probably a starting point. And I think the, the point is, just like your entire uh, you know, college career is the question, right? So you find out this little shock value statistic and you start to investigate what that actually is. There are other networks that are covering these issues quite well. There are organizations that are painstakingly trying to get the message out. And it's, it doesn't take much in the Google search to sort of pull up you know, what's happening in the Philippines or in Indonesia, for example, where you can start to get exposed. But I think there's an expectation in specifically US media outlets where their expectation of people is that our attention span is so short, right, that they can kind of talk about two stories over and over and over and over and over. Which is different. What I find is really interesting, so in Atlanta, the, the CNN, for example, has their two towers. Their international news network is not great, but it's not terrible. <laughs> but it's in the same building, and they have a, 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 a meeting every day, apparently, where they kind of exchange notes and they kind of go to their separate silos, literally, um, and project news. So I feel like YouTube would have probably some great BBC coverage, Al Jazeera. I mean, there are networks that are doing a better job in some regions other than over others, perhaps, uh, that are to tell some of those stories. But again, this is where, this is the niche that we're hoping to fill as well, as Inspiraction. It's a kind of, in a short, accessible way, cause people to ask questions. Yes? Hi. Uh, so, it's very commonly said that when you watch the news, it's very, oh, the world is ending, it's awful. There's a lot of uh, coverage on bad events. Sure. And 
I've commonly heard that you should sometimes take a step back from that because only seeing all the negativity is sometimes detrimental to yourself. How do you deal with all of these? Obviously, you deal with so much injustice all the time. How does that affect you? Yeah, no, great question. Um, you know, it makes your own life issues really relative. <laughs> so is that a positive thing? I'm not sure. Um, but the reality is, yeah, I mean, there are tough days. There are sometimes you, there are moments at the UN when a young person comes to talk about their access to education uh, or their sexual health and rights, or which is just palpable. I mean, there's just, there's no way to get past the emotive quality of that intervention. Mm -hmm. But the reality is sitting in a little bubble in New York, uh, policy again is on mostly on statistics is sort of what drives that process. So there's some level of maybe healthy separation from the issue. Mm -hmm. um, it's really when you immerse yourself in the, in the community that you're sort of part and parcel of this experience. Um, there are really interesting sort of psychological impacts by humanitarians and by folks that are responding to uh, famine, for instance, where like, folks who work all day long in situations of famine go back to their hotel and binge eat. It's like this psychosomatic response to trauma. There's, so there's, there are some things that I think self-care, sort of duty of care of organizations to make, the, make sure that our psychosocial support is for staff as well as for communities we serve. Mm -hmm. And there can be serious incidences where, you know, there's been some, some legal proceedings recently with a few organizations that haven't quite done enough to sort of provide that social support. Um, for me, I, again, this is where this community piece that I started with comes in because I thankfully have a community of people I can kind of go to and regain that perspective. And very few of them work in this sort of nonprofit uh, humanitarian response sector. So they're going to bring their drama and kind of puts everything into perspective. We kind of have a conversation in that community. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps as well. But no silver bullet, unfortunately. <laughs> but, you know, that we're all more empathetic would probably be better in the first place. <laughs> so. Yeah? Oh, cool. I was just wondering, you said that most of the work to treat symptoms but not disease, what would you consider the main root problem to be? Yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's really difficult to pinpoint exactly what the root cause of, of a crisis may actually be. Um, but there's more sort of looking at structures and systems that have exacerbated things like racism, like marginalization of some populations. So it's this combination of efforts where you have a programmatic approach that might be developing a new business for, that benefits the community and has expectations of sort of gender diversity within that workforce that offers opportunities for people to sort of have some resilience and get out of a, a difficult situation themselves, while at the same time you're at the ILO, the International Labor Organization, and you know Capitol Hill asking that policy is generated to sort of completely reform those structures that reinforce those kinds of poverty traps. So it's sort of a, it's a two-pronged approach. Like I think identify some of those opportunities. Now, and I realize, that, again, this, this moment we find ourselves in, some of that root cause conversation can have really detrimental um, side discourses on immigration, right? This idea of we put a lot of money into, for instance, Central America, providing lots of support. There's a, there's a pretty gnarly history of US interventions in that part of the world to begin with, right? So this is the interesting part of of the development sector in general. The joke is essentially development and, and uh, meteorology have a lot in common, where we do both kind of are expected to kind of get it wrong most of the time. Um, <laughs> but the idea is we're testing, we're identifying opportunities that reach out to, to, to people and affect our lives. And so now we're looking more at an impact approach as a much as we are sort of the intervention of a specific project, right? So impact of the community, the state, the nation with advocacy towards policies at multiple levels. That helps. Yeah. yeah. So, um, other than the things you've already said, like if you had to do it all over again, starting here at Belleville, is there a class you would have taken, or is there a class that you did take, mm -hmm. or a program you were a part of that, that you think everybody should do, or you wish you had done? Yeah, great question. I think I would have talked a lot less and listened a lot more. Um, I think it's awesome. Going to university in England, for example, was a really interesting phenomenon where I didn't realize it was unusual to have the phenomenon of participation points. This idea that Americans are sort of like, raise your hand first, you get that little checkbox, you get your points, it goes towards your grade. 
What it does is, I think in a helpful way, it, it breeds a population that's really quite keen to jump in. Yeah? Then you go to other cultural contexts, and people aren't that way. So the American students stand out like, like sore thumbs, to be honest, because we're sort of in tutorial with our hands up right away. Everyone else is processing, <laughs> thinking about it. You know, so I think that's one lesson that I probably, if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have been like, you know what? I'm going to read a little more. I'm going to hear what other people have to say, which I think would have been really quite helpful. Um, classes, I think, you know, the benefit, this institute didn't exist when I was at Valpo, for example. And I think coming again, it's about this community you're establishing. So there's amazing sort of courses that are offered that give you perspectives on these sort of cultural realities. But at the same time, I really think that there's probably a cultivation of a community of like-minded individuals that are passionate about similar things and kind of have a conversation together. And that would have been quite cool. Um, I wasn't super sort of socially active on campus. I don't mean that I wasn't on the frat sign, you know, dry campus. Um, well, what I mean is essentially I wasn't out like protesting. And the reality is like, right, so what are we supposed to not talk about at a dinner, like a family dinner, right? Religion and politics. And now I've cultivated a career that's entirely that, right? So it's quite awesome. And I feel like if I had the same conviction and the same confidence that in those learned lessons, in that waking up to the world around me and stepping out of that bubble, yeah, it would be kind of cool to bring some of that to campus uh, in a nice way. But I've already seen some of the, the solidarity chalking and some of the stuff with salt that they're doing, and it seems like that culture is really quite is here. And you guys have the benefit that you're part of, you know, a generation that is woke, well, or needs to quickly become woke. Wait, uh, yeah. <laughs> Listen, is that what you say? Uh, yes, to wake up. Um, and the reality is, I, you know, when I was here, there was still sort of this very complacent reality that's happening. And I think how exciting to be part of the generation that's responsible for this sort of movement towards we want more, you know? As opposed to, we have plenty, thank you. So I think you're already part of something that's really transformative, I hope, and will continue to be. I think that was something that I wish I could have had more of at Calvo. Is that true? I'm making this assumption, that's really unfair. <laughs> Do you guys feel awake? Yeah, I mean, a lot of us come from Lutheran backgrounds. The ELCA and the Missouri Senate, these are really white churches, right? We're exposed to white people. <laughs> we talk, you know what I mean? Um, and I feel like that's totally fine, that's what it is. But when you have opportunities to kind of see beyond yourself, have a conversation, learn something new, engage with something beyond yourself, I mean, no one's going to be worse off. 